Welcome back to Language Development. This week we'll be discussing Baker Chapter 2 and Chapter 15. So let's go straight into our discussion. In Chapter 2 of Baker, the focus of that chapter is on how bilinguals are measured and assessed. So we'll discuss that today in our Bilinguals are measured in various ways and for various purposes. The first way that bilinguals are measured is often through the census or through a language distribution survey. And these are demographic information to find out where certain speakers of languages live and what is the percentage of the population that is speaking a language other than English. Another reason that bilinguals are often measured is for selection or placement in particular educational programs, such as bilingual programs and ESL programs. Often, bilinguals, when they first enter school, are provided a pre-assessment test. One of the most popular ones is called the Woodcock Munoz test. And that pre-assessment test evaluates how students' abilities, or excuse me, evaluates students' abilities in in English and also in their native language. And so based on the results of that test, students are placed in either bilingual, ESL, or completely monolingual, non-ESL programs. And the committee in Texas that determines that is called the LPAC committee, the Language Proficiency Assessment Committee. And each school has one, and it's required that each school also has the, a member of the community that serves on the LPAC committee. So the LPAC committee is cons um, consists of both teachers, um, administrators, and community members. The LPAC committee, ap apart from assigning students initial placement in particular language programs, the LPAC committee is also largely involved in the, in the placement of bilingual students after each year of their education. So every year, according to No Child Left Behind, bilingual students have to take a yearly proficiency test in English. And in Texas, the students receive the TELPASS exam. The TELPASS exam measures students in all four domains of language, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And the TELPASS exam often provides a summative assessment or summative data for how students are acquiring English. Based on the TELPASS performance of students and based on the district criteria for placement of bilingual students, the LPAC committee will meet and make recommendations on where students will place. In the end, parents have the final say over what program students participate in, but the LPAC committee often provides um, professional guidance for those parents. In general, when we talk about assessment, there's two types, and so I want to quickly review these two types of assessments, because both types are used regularly for bilingual instruction and also for instruction for English language learners. So first of all, we have formative assessments. So formative assessments are used to immediately drive instruction. So basically, they're often informal measures that can quickly be presented and based on the results, the teacher can adapt their teaching based on how students perform. So if students perform well on the formative assessment, the teacher can move on to the next topic. If students are struggling on that formative assessment, this is an excellent time for teachers to stop what they're doing in terms of their progress of the new content and they go back and reteach in a different way. And so one example where Formative assessments are often used for bilingual students in ESL, English language learners, is in the formative assessment of vocabulary acquisition. After each lesson, ideally, teachers are providing 
some kind of formative measure to make sure that the English language learners are acquiring the necessary content vocabulary. The second form of assessments includes summative assessments. Summative assessments are comprehensive exams and they measure the language proficiency. So some of the assessments can also be measuring content, but in the, in the domains of our classroom, we're going to focus on summative assessments that measure language proficiency in particular. And so in Texas, once again, the summative assessment is the telepass. It occurs one time in the year, normally in um, early spring, February and March. And this is a time where students yearly progress and their four domains of language is being assessed and it's a one-time assessment and the results are found out in a couple months and so normally teachers get the results at close to the end of the year and so since they get the results at the end of the year and also since it's the nature of the assessment and that teachers can't really see the summative assessment because it's distributed by the state most of the results are not used to immediately drive instruction like a formative assessment. Instead, the results are used, once again, to help place bilingual and ESL students in the appropriate programs for the following year. Let's also talk about norm reference and criterion reference tests. So norm reference tests compare students to each other and they set up a percentile of total test takers. And so examples of norm reference tests are SATs, ACTs, the STAR. All of these tests have the average score and they also place students and their performance on a percentile compared to how other students performed. Then we have criterion reference tests. Criterion reference tests do not compare students directly. Rather, they measure particular skills that to see if students know those skills or do not know those skills. For example, a test could measure the words per minute that a student reads. It could be whether a student can hold an academic conversation effectively and communicate and complete sentences with their teacher or, with, or if the student can write in personal narratives in the correct tense based on the time frame of the story they're writing. All of those are criterion reference tests. They're based on a particular skill. And once again, students are not compared to how they relatively perform to other students. It's whether it's more of a yes or no. Um, yes, I, they can actually do this activity or they do have this content knowledge or no, they do not. So... In general, there's been a trend toward criterion reference tests for bilinguals. And the reason why is that often norm reference tests can disadvantage bilinguals. So often norm reference tests compare bilingual students to monolingual English students. And especially at the very beginning years of school, it's an unfair comparison because most bilingual programs in the beginning concentrate on developing students first language ability, so their native language ability, so that they can transfer those abilities to their second language, English. And so since most of the bilingual programs are focused on developing students' first language, which for example could be Spanish or Vietnamese or Mandarin, students often receive less exposure to the English vocabulary terms that are being tested on those norm reference tests. Moreover, as we've discussed before, a lot of students' background vocabulary knowledge comes from the home environment. So many English language learners are living in home environments that speak a language other than English. And so they are not developing that, that vocabulary because they simply are having less time exposure and less um, opportunities to receive and hear those vocabulary words in English. And so the vocabulary often of an English language learner is significantly less than a monolingual native English speaker in the early years of schooling. The more years in schooling though, the, the, the smaller the gap is. 
the English language learners often catch up and even can surpass their monolingual native English speaking counterparts in their vocabulary ability. However, they do need that formal support from the schools to overcome some of the um, lack of exposure that they might get at home to those vocabulary words. So another reason why criterion reference tests are often encouraged now for bilingual students is that criterion reference tests are similar to formative assessments and that teachers can use results from those criterion reference tests to directly inform their instruction. They know the specific skills that students need to improve upon and they can apply those skills in the classroom. A, a further assessment that sometimes instructors use is, is self-assessment, where students reflect on their own abilities in their native language and their second language. So in the United States, it would most likely be English as their second language. And that would be the majority language as well. Once again, going back to the formative versus summative nature, norm reference tests are often summative. As I've mentioned before, for example, on the STAR test or on the TELPASS test, teachers are actually required not to look at the tests, not only, of course, before administering the test, but even during administering the test. The teacher is not allowed to look at the, the topics of the test or the content that's on the test or to discuss those with the student. And so teachers often do not get the results until the summer after that student has left their classroom. So in, by its nature, no, norm reference tests are often summative exams in which teachers have less of an ability to actually implement the results directly into their classroom. Let's talk about some of the limitations of the types of bilingual measurement we've just discussed. The first limitation is ambiguity. So some of the terms that we've mentioned are not so easily measurable. For example, how do you define someone as proficient? Is it someone that can hold casual conversations? Or is it someone that can, can write effectively using academic vocabulary? What, what is our term for proficient? And so often the term for proficient also differs based on the statewide definition. Another reason that there are limitations in the results of these measurement and assessments is the context. So, so many times these assessments focus on one particular context, yet they have, it has been shown that bilinguals often have varying abilities to communicate, in, especially in their second language, English, based on the context. So bilinguals might be very effective in communicating, and for example, when they're shopping or in social conversations or in working um, on the work site, on the job or in real world vocabulary, yet they might have a very different and less broad and less um, developed ability to communicate in academic conversations or in particular content subjects. So you have to be very careful of the context in that in what bilinguals are being tested upon. Furthermore, there could be a self-perception bias for the self-assessment. So when students are given self-assessments, most students want to be positive and they don't want to be ridiculed by their peers or by their teacher or looked down upon. And so they'll often over um, state or be overconfident in their abilities to speak a language. A further limitation of focusing too much or putting too much stock on tests is the whole idea of the test aura. So many times standardized tests are viewed as these authoritative, important, authentic assessments that adequately measure what they are supposed to measure, and that they are kind of the end-all, tell-all tale of students' academic abilities. Yet, most tests, for example, do not have complete accuracy, and only certain tests are considered reliable. And many of the tests that students receive are considered not reliable. So if they 
if they were given to students in another situation over another context, students would perform differently. Moreover, many tests that are provided to students have limited validity. So there's a limited chance that they're actually measuring what they're supposed to be measuring. Another issue is the narrow sampling of dimensions of language. So many times standardized tests focus on particular domains of language, such as reading and writing. But language is a very broad and complex topic, and especially the, the few vocabulary words that are used or tested on standardized tests are a very limited amount of vocabulary words. Students could know and have a pretty broad vocabulary or could be able to communicate through speaking and listening very effectively, but most likely that might not be tested on the test because the test has a limited amount of context that are being tested and a limited amount of words that they pick for the passages or for the questions. And so it, there, it's not a fair representation of all that what bi bilinguals know and all the vocabulary words, all the language abilities, and all the context that bilinguals can use their language. A sixth reason why there's a limitation in measurement is also that there's an insensitivity to change. So the test results are really only good for about a month or less. They're an instant snapshot of students' abilities. But most English language learners are learning English and are learning their native language, hopefully, at a very quick pace, a rapid pace. So results from February might not be very accurate for how students are progressing in, in April. Yet people, when they see these summative assessments that are these big scale, um, high stakes testing assessments, they assume that students are still at that level, even though they probably progress beyond that. A seventh limitation is labeling. So based on how students perform on tests, teachers have that conception that that is the level of the student. So if a student receives intermediate level in the tell pass for the last spring, the teacher the following year might still be considering that student as an intermediate student, even though that student could have progressed, or most likely that student's abilities might fall between two positions. So they might be between an intermediate and advanced English speaking student or English reading student. And so that label false falsely and misrepresents the student's true abilities. There's another type of testing that we've mentioned a little bit before in, in our readings. It's called communicative language testing. And so this assesses how students perform in real communicative situations. So like social situations, like if they're in the store, on the job, in a school setting, um, in a extracurricular setting, all of those things measure in a particular context or situation. And these tests focus on communicative competence. So it's more about, is the student able to get their point across and to communicate effectively? And so one example of this would be like an oral interview where students are asked to answer questions orally. So they listen to the question and they answer it orally and using their speaking language domain. There are a couple limitations to these types of testing as well, because sometimes oral interviews can often be based on the perceptions of who is administering the test. So whoever is administering the test could affect how students respond and how comfortable they feel in answering the questions. Furthermore, whoever is grading the test could also have somewhat of subjective bias based on their perceptions of language. And so one limitation with communicative language testing is that it could be somewhat subjective based on who gives the test and who, admit, who grades the test. Even though there are these limitations, Baker explains that probably the best situation would be a compromise where you would have both paper and pencil tests so they'll formative assessments and summative assessments, but also have um, communicative language testing. And one particular way you could have communicative language testing is considering uh, 
um, the extended observations of, for a long period of time. So it's not just based on one context, but on many different contexts. And it's not just based on one day alone, but many months. And actually, the state of Texas used to have that as part of the administration of the telepaths. The teachers used to be responsible for providing a yearly evaluation of their students' speaking and listening abilities in English. The only problem with that, though, was that since teachers were encouraged to make adequate yearly progress or else their schools would be in trouble or they personally could get in trouble, teachers often over or overinflated the scores of students' English abilities to show that students were making yearly progress. And so ideally, a situation where teachers are providing extended observations over time would also have teachers not feel pressure to score higher to make themselves look better. So maybe it would be a um, an outside observer or a co-teacher or even a test where teachers are not disciplined or rewarded for their student results. It's just a, a benchmark level to see how students are communicating. Another issue with language testing is that it's often based on politics. So policies often affect how language tests are administered and also test also affect how those language tests will influence later instruction. One thing to note is that many times academic tests are somewhat biased. They emphasize academic language over informal language, and they emphasize reading abilities over speaking. And so certain groups that have less academic vocabulary, which has been shown through research to be often students who, have, who come from more disadvantaged economic backgrounds, those students are at a disadvantage for taking the test. Also, certain communities might not have that background cultural knowledge that is often created by the test, that is often used by the test creators. So most of the time, the people who create tests are educators that come from middle class backgrounds and who have a high amount of education. Well, many students do not come from those backgrounds, and so if the test is written for students or children who have parents of that background, children who do not have parents of that background might be at a disadvantage. A further issue with the politics of language testing is that teachers often feel pressure to teach to the test. And so once again, with the issues of tests not always being valid and reliable, and also the issue with tests being somewhat biased against certain groups, Teaching to the test can be very detrimental for students. A further issue with um, focusing on testing is that most testing is provided in the majority language. And so then there's an emphasis on the majority language over the minority language, which can hurt bilingual students' conceptions of their culture and the value of learning their language. It can lead to a subtractive context where bilinguals unfortunately feel that they must replace their native language with the majority language English. There are some other types of language assessments that we can briefly go over. Some of them are once again self-reported language use surveys and these are not necessarily about students abilities in the language but all, but basically in which situations what language um, context and with which people what language targets do people use their language and so this is just to kind of assess what language is used most often by the student. Another way that language can be evaluated is also um, to measure students' relative bilingual abilities between both languages that they speak. So one of them could be um, a language balance or dominance measures. And these, some of these include like a speed of word association. So a student who might be bilingual in Spanish and English might be asked to come up with an associated word 
for um, in both languages for a common noun. And the students that can think of the association the fastest in this, the particular language will, will demonstrate that they have a dominance for that language. So if someone um, tells a student table in English and the student has to think of an associated word like uh, chair or legs of the table or food or something like that that related to table and they do that in English or they do that in Spanish at a faster rate whichever whichever language they they can think of associated words at a faster rate is supposedly the language that they are dominant in they could still be pretty fluent in both languages but they have a preference for one language over the other Another way to do that is also to measure the quantity of reactions. So if students are asked to come up with synonyms or associated words in both languages, the language in which they can think of more words that are related to the noun, the, that means the broader their vocabulary in that language. Another way also is to measure students' reading speed and comprehension in both languages using uh, language, link, using text that are written in both uh, languages. But just like many of the other issues that we've talked about, all of these measurements have limitations. So it's not, you can't have a end all for sure rule of how students are dominant in one language versus the other. One way that the United States measures language is through the language census. It counts the number of speakers of a language. So in the United States, they found that over 20% of the population speaks a language other than English at home. There are also issues with these language censuses as well. Many people think that they're politically charged or influenced. So based on who writes the census or what they're looking for or who funds the census and which communities they, they reach out toward, the census could be um, biased certain against particular groups. Another issue is that some people might say that their language might state their language choice, but really what they're referring to is their um, cultural identity or their um, ethnic identity. And so sometimes that can be mixed together with language use. So someone who really doesn't speak a lot of Spanish, but identifies with Latino and Hispanic culture could theoretically pick Spanish as their home language, even though they might also speak English just as much. Or vice versa. So someone who identifies more as Mexican American or Latino American or Hispanic American, and they, foc they might um, focus more and identify with speaking English at home when actually they might speak both languages at home. The th another issue with the census is that many times it's underrepresentative of and unrepresentative of the population. And so many groups that are, many groups are wary of strangers asking them questions about their language use and about their ethnicity and many people also are just very private individuals. And so the census often cannot really count effectively all of the people that do speak a different language other than English at home. Let's talk now about chapter 15, the special education needs of bilinguals and also the assessment and testing of bilinguals in terms of special education. It's important that we first begin with a discussion of special education terms, which have evolved over time. One thing to consider as what we talked about in terms of language ability could also be applied to cognitive ability. And that's the concept of deficit thinking versus asset thinking. So a def deficit thinking sees things as a negative that could hinder a person's educational progress or could cause problems and make them different than the majority. Whereas an asset views it as a something that defines that person in a positive way 
and that can be used in a, in a positive way in the future for their educational growth. So there are some deficit terms of, that often we've moved away as educators from using. And these deficit terms describe um, students who have learning differences. So some of the deficit terms, which we've moved away upon, are words like disabled, handicapped, impaired, difficulty, disorder. All of those things are very negative in nature. So it, it's almost like it punishes someone in the terms, in, in what term they're being called, for, for an issue that they have had no control over that they were born with. Meanwhile, on the other hand, a more positive asset-based terms would be like using words like extraordinary learners or students with learning differences, special education, exceptional students, or students that need additional needs. All of these things consider students' differences as an asset and in a positive light. It's very important to note that sometimes people have a misconception that bilingualism can cause learning differences or can cause learning difficulties or language delays like a, a, slow, um, a slowness in acquiring English, for example. That is um, completely false. So bilingualism has nothing to do with the brain's cognitive abilities or speed of learning language. Uh, in fact, if it, if it does have an effect, it has a positive effect, as we've talked about, how it develops students' um, divergent thinking where they're, and creative thinking and their ability to um, interrelate with different groups of people quickly. Let's now talk about gifted multilingual and bilingual children. So giftedness and talentedness follows under special education and under that spectrum because these students are especially extraordinary or advanced on the spectrum of students based on their abilities. So these students hold advanced, um, extraordinary or exemplary abilities to cognitively and logically make connections. Maybe they're especially talented with certain um, in either verbal ability or mathematical ability, or they might also be especially talented in their abilities of leadership and creativity. Unfortunately, bilinguals and multilinguals are in fact underrepresented in gifted and talented programs across the nation. They're also underrepresented in advanced courses and college preparatory tracks. So they've done studies and the based on the percentage of students that are bilingual, that same percentage is not being reflected in the percentage of students that are making up GT programs and making up advanced courses and college preparatory courses. This is unfortunate, not just because of the underrepresentation, but it also goes against somewhat what we have learned earlier in the class and that bilingualism actually benefits the brain. And so theoretically, bilinguals would probably, if the assessment was fair and accurate of students' abilities, bilinguals would might be overrepresented in GT programs. As we've talked about before, bilinguals have increased cognitive benefits because of their bilingualism. They have increased metalinguistic and verbal abilities. They are more able to think creatively and have divergent thinking where they see multiple points of view. They also, of course, use both sides of their brain. And so overall, bilinguals, theoretically, based on the benefits of bilingualism, should be in the gifted and talented programs at least represented it fairly and accurately. Another issue is that bilinguals could also qualify, if you could also qualify for gifted and talented programs, 
if gifted and talented programs considered one of the talents as interpret as being a, an effective interpreter. Bilinguals are especially effective interpreters in sense because they can navigate cross-culturally between two cultures and also cross linguistically or against or across both languages. This is of course a, an extraordinary skill and that arguably could be just as valuable as being creative or being a leader could be the ability to have bicultural awareness and bicultural abilities. So many issues, there are many issues for why bilinguals are underrepresented in gifted and talented programs. But one issue in particular is that many times the gifted and talented programs start to recruit at an early age. And during that age, the gifted and talented programs are often in the majority language. So they're often presented to students in English. And so it's very difficult for bilingual students who are still developing their English abilities to qualify for those gifted and talented programs based on those standardized tests. Also, the people who serve on the committee might not be aware of bilingualism, they might not understand bilingualism, or they might also just not speak the language that students speak. And so when they give those oral interviews to help see if students qualify for the GT program, the oral interviews will once again be in students' second language English. And so bilingual students have a disadvantage, especially when they're being evaluated in the early grades, like kindergarten, first, and second grade. Another thing that's interesting that um, connects slightly to gifted and talented programs is that there's been studies that often Asperger's syndrome is a sign of gifted and talentedness in the sense that Asperger's, people who suffer from or have Asperger's, not really suffer, but have it as a condition, they are often have difficulty understanding other people's um, points of view or other people's um, meaning when they're communicating with other people. However, Asperger's, people who have Asperger's often are very high achieving and have high intelligence levels because they have a particular cognitive focus, especially in their interests. Well, bilingualism has been found in some research studies to actually help students who are bilingual and have Asperger's. Bilingualism has been shown to be a tool to help students with Asperger's connect better with other groups of people and to better understand and read social situations. Now, now let's talk about the frequency of special needs in bilingual children. So bilinguals overall are overrepresented in special education programs in the United States. On average, in the United States, about 10% of students in general are in special education programs, and 6% of students have learning disabilities. However, as we've just mentioned, since they're overrepresented, bilinguals are often above those numbers in many states. On the other end of the spectrum, some states Bilinguals are very underrepresented. So bilinguals are only, let's say, 1% or one, only 1% 1 of English language learners are represented in special education. And in the, in the example of Maryland and South Carolina, only 1% of ELL students are in special education, while the national average, as we've talked about, is 10%. So there's obviously a, a big discrepancy there. Another type of learning difference such as dyslexia, with dyslexia, ELL students are also under-identified because many times schools are hesitant to test students on their dyslexia because they consider it more of a, a language issue or they misidentify or misdiagnose the student's uh, learning difference as a language difference, not um, having dyslexia. Let's talk a little bit about language delay. So language delay is a delay in 
starting to speak or having trouble expressing oneself. And many times, as we mentioned a little bit earlier today in this presentation, there's been a misconception that bilingualism is a cause for language delay. Bilingualism is not a cause for language delay. Bilingualism has no influence on the speed in which students choose or children choose to communicate or their ability to communicate. It has no negative influence. Also, it's very unwise to, to switch from bilingual to monolingual instruction as a, in hopes of fixing a language delay. Um, there's two reasons that Baker points out why this would be bad. First, switching from bilingual to monolingual could cause a big drastic change and could disturb or confuse the child. Also, they've done studies and children are much more likely to become effective communicators in their native language or their home language first. And so if you're really concerned about having that student develop language and begin to communicate and increase their speed of interaction with other people, it's best to provide them instruction in their native language, which they hear more often. Now let's talk about bilingual special education. Most bilingual special education students are better served in bilingual programs versus monolingual ESL programs, and there's a couple of reasons why. First, if, if bilingual special education students are served in bilingual classrooms, they are, have a greater likelihood of success and increased possibility for increased self-esteem since they're working with their native language, which they have more exposure to. Another reason is parents can be more involved in their students' education if the language of instruction is the language spoken at home. So students are learning in their native language and then they go home and get help in their native language from their parents, they are often more likely to be successful in the classroom. And this is especially important for um, students who receive special education services. They especially need support from parents. Another thing that they found is that students with learning differences can still become proficient in both languages. And it may or may not be at the same level or same pace of other students, but they can still ha have bilingual abilities. So they can still benefit from being bilingual and being bicultural and being able to find better types of occupations that, in which they can use both languages. Now let's talk about bilingual special education policies and procedures. An overarching policy and procedure of all special education in the United States is the principle of inclusion. Inclusion means that students are being served in, with their age level peers as much as possible. This is called the least restrictive environment. So students that receive special education services as much as possible are being educated and included in regular instruction with their age level peers. The level of inclusion is based on the student's individual education plan, which is a specialized plan that is made by administrators, teachers, parents, and community members to help determine what's best for that particular student's overall academic success. So let's talk about the reason why bilinguals might be overrepresented in special education. And one key issue is that many times bilinguals are being misdiagnosed. So educators are believing that bilingual students have a learning difference when really they're learn they do not have a learning difference, but they're experiencing a learning difficulty for another reason. Some of these reasons can be the following. So it could be poverty, deprivation, child abuse, or child neglect. Some bilingual students unfortunately suffer um, and experience those negative conditions. And this could cause a learning struggle. Um, it could cause a learning difficulty for those students, but they actually do not have a cognitive difference or a learning difference in understanding. It's an issue, it's an issue of a situation. 
A second reason can be a mismatch of culture and expectations, especially for newcomer um, bilingual students. Often, if they have experienced school in their home countries and it's vastly different than the school system in the United States, they might be initially very confused and very um, have and have a significant difficulty in adjusting to the U.S. educational system. A third reason is that it could be a it could be a fact of poor instruction on behalf of the school. So maybe that bilingual student is not receiving the necessary instruction they need. So they could either not be being served in a bilingual program, they're receiving only all English instruction, which we've discussed uh, and we will discuss in the future as being ineffective. Students are best served by receiving instruction in their native language first and also developing English at the same time. So students are best served by being proficient in both languages, the native language and in English. So it could be a problem of that where students aren't being served in the correct program or they could just have had uh, a teacher who's unqualified to serve English language learners or just not necessarily unqualified but maybe just less experienced or um, maybe is somewhat ineffective at serving English language learners. A fourth reason could be that the school could actually be inhibiting the student's native language or culture. And so if the student, if the student feels that they are being repressed culturally and that their, um, nati their native language is being re repressed and their identity is being repressed, that could have a negative effect and children could um, kind of withdraw emotionally from the educational system. A fifth reason could be that many times bilingual students come into school with high anxiety because it's an uh, unknown context and most of the language is, is spoken in the school setting is English. And so it could be a very stressful time for students and also could have students have very low self-esteem at that time. And so that could cause students to underperform academically. A sixth reason could be that sometimes students are struggling academically for other reasons, for social reasons. And so they could have trouble making friends or there could also be negative situations such as bullying of bilingual students. And so sometimes educators misdiagnose students' academic difficulties as caused by a learning difference when really it's, a, it's the student is being very distracted in the classroom and outside the classroom socially. A seventh reason why bilinguals might be uh, misdiagnosed for special education services is that many times there's a misconception or a misunderstanding of, a, of the gradient or speed of learning. Everybody learns at different paces and different speeds. And just the fact that you have a different speed of learning does not mean that you cannot have a significant um, learning acquisition of the topic. So even though someone might learn a topic at a slower speed, they could still learn it as comprehensively and as adequately as someone who learns it very quickly. And so this could be a missed, once again, a misdiagnosis. So just because someone learns at a different speed or or learns a, a, a second language at a different speed does not mean necessarily that they have a learning difference that, or a cognitive difference in their brain. Let's talk about the assessment and placement of bilinguals. And these are best practices for how bilinguals should be assessed on whether they qualify for special education services and how they should be placed in those services. So first of all, when bilingual students are assessed on whether they qualify for special education and or gifted and talented programs, bilinguals must be assessed ideally in their first language, their native language, or whatever language that they have a dominant ability in. The easiest way to, um, to and the most effective way probably to test bilinguals would be to test them in both languages, their native language and in English. So regardless of which language they're dominant in, both languages are being considered and their abilities in both languages are being utilized 
on the test to see whether students do qualify for special education services or not. Another way that could also address the issue of over-identification of bilingual students in special education programs is the issue of early identification, assessment, and intervention. So instead of immediately referring students to special education or waiting till the student fails a grade or fails a big um, scale test to start to be concerned of that student, the easiest way would be to identify students who are struggling from the beginning and work from, let's say, kindergarten, first grade, work with those students to provide intervention and remediation and instruction for those students. Because it could not necessarily be a learning difference, but it could just be the students having some temporary difficulty and that with a little bit of effective instruction, small group instruction or ind individual one-on-one -on -one instruction and support, that student can, can quickly catch up to their peers and be on level. And one way that teachers do this is to have is to follow the RTI or the response to intervention process. And the response to intervention process means that students are classified based on, on means that students are classified based on tiers. So you have three tiers of students. Tier one are all of your students, or these are students that are on grade level. Tier two are students that are less than a year behind. And often the um, prescription for helping those students is to, to provide small group instruction for those students several times a week. Tier three are students that are more than a year behind. And so these students need significant small group and one-on-one -on -one remediation. And often, ideally, the best way to do that is to provide daily remediation and daily small group support for those students so they can catch up to their age level peers. Let's talk about some of the special education policies for bilinguals in the United States. First of all, it's a requirement in the United States that for special education tests for bilingual students, students must first be tested to see if they're proficient in English. So before they can be given a special education test in English, they have to first be tested to see if they are proficient in English. If students are not proficient in English, bilinguals must be tested for special, special education in their native language. Also, all correspondence that is sent to parents concerning special education testing and placement must be sent to the parents in their native language. Furthermore, during any meetings, any special education meetings or um, admis admission or referral or dismissal ARD meetings for special education, an interpreter should be available and should be present for that parent if there is, if it is possible to have an interpreter. Furthermore, bilingual students cannot just be admitted into special education based on one assessment. There must be multidimensional evidence to admit bilingual students. So it cannot just be one standardized test, but it could include things such as observations, student work products, um, teacher interviews, student interviews, parent interviews, all of these are multidimensional evidence. And so these conditions were set up largely as a response to, the, unfortunately, the over-identification of bilinguals in special education policies. The government set these regulations to prevent um, the misidentification of bilinguals in special education, where bilinguals were unfortunately being placed in special education at high numbers due to language differences or language learning issues, not uh, overall learning and cognitive differences. Let's talk about some of the best practices for assessing and testing bilingual children. So first of all, students should be tested in their stronger language or ideally both languages.
teachers should consider temporary difficulties as separate from a learning difference. Moreover, teachers should play a pivotal role in determining whether a student qualifies for special education or not. It shouldn't be just based on the administrator's observations. Whoever is giving the test should speak the student's native language and understand that student's culture to effectively be able to evaluate and diagnose if that student has a learning difference or not. One thing to note is that tests can be inaccurate, unreliable, or invalid. And so it's very important to use a variety of test measures, not just one measure. Furthermore, the language used in the test should be similar or comparable to the type of language that was used in the original English test. So sometimes they have issues with translating a test and that the translators will often translate um, a test using stilted or more formal academic language. And so it's very important that translators accurately transfer, uh, translate the test into the type and type and um, the type of language and the level of sophistication of language that was originally given in the English test. Furthermore, testing should make sure to be able to differentiate between students' language profile and their performance profile. So testing should be able to differentiate between whether this is a language difference or a language struggle or an issue of language ability or is it an issue with, a cog with cognitive abilities or content related abilities. Furthermore, authentic language should be used in the test. The language should be relative to um, the real world, it should be applicable and something that the student would see in their daily interactions. And it should also be um, language that is relevant to the student in terms of their interest and their future goals. Let's talk about accommodations. We've talked about this a little bit in Chapter 9, but in the No Child Left Behind Act in 2001, ELLs were required to take standardized tests. They could not be exempt. However, although they are required to take standardized tests, they also can be provided certain accommodations. So they could be given extra time, bilingual dictionaries, manipulatives, so like hands-on resources like uh, base 10 blocks or money, fraction um, strips. They could also be provided tests in which the text had reduced uh, linguistic complexity or where they were provided images for difficult vocabulary words or bilingual students can even qualify for oral administration. So if you do serve English language learners as a teacher, which you most likely will, it's very important to be aware of the accommodations and they often change each year. And so if you think your student would benefit from something like extra time or having a dictionary, or having manipulatives, or even he hearing the test being read to them out loud, oral administration, make sure to advocate for your ELL students in front of the LPAC committee and also to administrators. Often administrators will be willing and interested to help you. One thing to note though is that you can't, one general rule is that you should not have your entire class receive accommodations. Only the ones that really need the accommodations should receive it. So your high achieving students that happen to be bilingual should um, often receive normal testing situ a, a normal testing circumstance. You should save accommodations for students that would particularly benefit or would particularly need them. Let's talk a little bit about tests and testing. As we've discussed before, sometimes the tests that are given to bilingual students, including the tests that are given for to see whether bilingual students qualify for special education services, have issues. So one issue is that norm reference tests often have some form of bias. So the, the, the test makers who make those norm reference tests come from a particular cultural and academic background. And so the language that they use on the test might be very different than the language that 
students are used to in their homes or in the school setting. Furthermore, we've talked about the issue of fairness and how often it's unfair to compare bilingual students to monolingual students on achievement tests that are written in English, especially in the early years of school when bilingual students are still developing their English abilities. Some other options could be where bilingual students receive curriculum-based assessments, which evaluates their particular knowledge of um, the content that was taught to them that semester, or it could also be measuring their application of the content that was taught in the class. Another way could be a criterion reference test, which are performance-based tests in which bilingual students are asked to perform a particular activity or to uh, apply their knowledge in a particular way, and then students are evaluated on whether they can or cannot do that activity. So let's talk about some overall assessment solutions and conclusions for how to best serve bilingual students. So first of all, it's very important that the assessment is authentic. It should be a collection that's collected over time, not just over one particular period. And one issue, one way, excuse me, that we could do this is through a portfolio. Furthermore, when it's authentic assessments, it has to be relevant to what students are learning in class, what they're interested in, and also relevant to the real world. Furthermore, we have to think about the eco ecological approach to testing. So we, it's important that we observe students not only in the classroom, but also outside the classroom and how they perform in communication and logical um, activities, once again, both in and outside the classroom. Furthermore, we have to also think about dynamic assessments. So dynamic assessments are pretty much like formative assessments. These could be a nice alternative to summative assessments and that those dynamic assessments can be used by teachers to determine how they can provide future language scaffolds and future cognitive scaffolds for students. Finally, tests should also be employment related, collaborative or creative in nature. So many times bilinguals have a particular advantage and enjoy working in teams, collaborating across cultures, and being creative. As we talked about how bilinguals' brains are actually more um, developed in those areas often when compared to monolingual students. And so it's very important that we harness those abilities in a positive way by having students perform particular activities that they are good at and that they prefer.